We are ready for day two of Passwords 11. I hope that everybody enjoyed uh, last uh, last time. And uh, today we are starting with Karsten Lottmann from uh, Aston Young. And uh, I uh, I told him like 10 minutes ago that I was a little bit surprised because um, the, co the company where I'm working, um, Karsten is actually one of the auditors that is auditing us and including me. Uh, and so I actually thought that he was like, you know, a normal auditor with an economical background, but he actually proved out that he has his background from MTNU in Trondheim into some really uh, cool stuff that I think Carson will be presenting now. And since, um, since Chris Leo from Mozilla did, uh, couldn't come because he had changed uh, jobs uh, in the US now recently. Carsten was a real sport and said, "Well, I can, you know, I can do a presentation." And uh, so, Carsten, please come up, and uh, the stage is yours, really. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this one. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll be gentle, not like uh, Rolitz. Um, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, this is kind of a last call thing, but I've held this presentation before, so I think it will be fun. Uh, I know that you had a presentation on kind of the same subject last year, uh, on how to recover encryption keys and stuff like that through uh, FireWire <coughs> forensics, uh, specifically from Passware, wasn't it? Passware, yeah. yep. Um, so I won't cover that bit again, but I will try to expand a bit on the, um, on the techniques that one can use to exploit uh, endpoints or specifically mobile devices. And this case, uh, PC, but it could be really anything. Uh, and uh, what I want to take home from this is, uh, is that uh, passwords, pins, uh, credentials, biometrics, everything that is handled through software on an insecure platform uh, is basically when an attacker gains physical access to, to a specific machine, uh, basically all bets are off. Uh, almost all that stuff. So um, that's basically what I want to show you. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate two techniques, which are kind of party trick hacks, but they are, I only use open source tools. And they will show you that two different ways that I can exploit the machine if I, if I um, get access to it. A bit of my, about my background, uh, Pierre mentioned that I work in Ernst Young. Uh, I work there mostly with pen testing, but I also do some audits, uh, IT audits primarily. Uh, but uh, primarily uh, pen testing and uh, well, physical security is one thing, and then the other thing I do is web pen testing, basically. Okay, so uh, the background from, from, for this talk is that uh, most of our clients do have like this layered structure of security, where the things that they want to protect is uh, down in the middle. Uh, and this is all good, uh, but then uh, their customers or, uh, or their uh, users, they come and they really want to have like mobile devices, uh, iPhone, iPad, you name it, and they want to have access to all the stuff that they have at work. So the usual solution then is to put kind of like a straw kind of, uh, and a bit of cheesy animation there, um, and give access to all the valuable information in here uh, out at the endpoint or mobile device. And from an attackish perspective, that makes the endpoint really interesting. Because if you, if you find a live machine with an open VPN connection, you might be able to exploit that and, and dig into uh, resources that you normally would not get access to without hacking through X layers. So, Mobile units, they present a kind of a real danger for many of our clients. Um, they are small, they are easy to drop, they are easy to, uh, to lose. Uh, they have, over the years, uh, quite a lot of connection possibilities. You can uh, USB, Bluetooth, whatever, uh, Wi-Fi. They have more and more storage, and you often lend it to a friend to transfer data. There's loads of security implications here with mobile devices, and it's not that easy. And they're always on. Uh, and for an attacker, if they get physical access to the uh, to the mobile device, uh, many mean that that basically has 
compromise the device. So my question is how certain are you that the hardware you're building your mobile device on are secure? Because many people put on loads and loads of security features on top of the hardware, uh, like software protection mechanisms, endpoint protection, you name it, uh, antivirus. <coughs> but uh, when you do kind of like a side channel attack, uh, or you exploit the hardware instead of the software, the software often is kind of, uh, does have limited knowledge on what happens on the hardware layer. So basically what people do to secure uh, mobile units is <laughs> basically two things. They encrypt everything, if they do that, um, uh, and they use password pin locking mechanisms to, to enable or, or to lock up the mobile device when it's not in use, for example. The two main protection methods, and of course you have antivirus and all that stuff as well. Uh, so they do that because there has been a lot of leaked data from mobile units, uh, among others uh, uh, hard drives from uh, laptops from English banks sold on eBay. So encryption has been um, more and more prevalent in in the mobile device, at least, at least in the enterprise market. So I think this number here speaks the most. Um, that is the number of lost laptops on US airports in 2008 alone. And the, this number, of course, doesn't say how uh, many of those laptops that were actually lost and then found, but still uh, there's quite a substantial bandwidth of data here uh, that is uh, traveling through unknown space and uh, through unknown hands. So uh, the potential for leakage is big, and of course, if you find a drive or whatever with a lot of data on it, it's quite easy to to just uh, copy it and distribute it online or through eBay. So we, at least in the enterprise market, to avoid this, you encrypt your drive. And uh, of course, as you guys know, uh, this is a slide for people who are less technical than you. But uh, the assumption that you are uh, th that all your security lies in when you use encryption is that the encryption key is secret. Uh, you can uh, you assume that the attacker knows everything about how your encryption mechanism works. But if, as long as you keep the C secret, the, the key secret, and the algorithm is strong, and the key is long enough, uh, you should be secure. That is kind of like the sign of the encryption mechanism. Uh, so the best part, uh, the best thing an attacker would be able to do is to try to guess the key given a good password, which, given a long enough key length, should be compute computationally infeasible. So when I I wrote my master thesis from uh, for um, Norwegian uh, Crime Investigation Service on this subject um, because they see now that they find more and more computers that are encrypted, a whole drive or just partitions or true crypt containers that are put online in Dropbox, stuff like that. And they want to know how, how the chance is to actually locate the encryption key somewhere on the hard drive or in the memory of the, the machine that has been used to encrypt. Because given a good password, they only have the chance of, well, having a pure lock chance of actually hitting the key during a, during, um, a brute force attack. And as these numbers illustrate, that is, that is more or less impossible if you use a 256 AES, for example. So in reality, uh, you would think that this is how you attack your crypto system. It is not. This is how you attack your crypto system more efficiently. Uh, you go through what I can call a side channel. This is, of course, a bit familiar. I wouldn't really recommend this, but it's probably a lot more effective than that. Um, so you go through a kind of side channel to get the password or the key. Uh, that is much more effective than trying to brute forcing uh, the, uh, the algorithm or, or the, the key. So um, the basis for my master's is on, on uh, NCIS uh, in Oslo was uh, physical memory analysts. So what I want to look at is what, what kind of data is there in memory when the machine is powered on and how can uh, forensic experts uh, get that data and uh, get it out from there forensically sound 
and uh, anal analyze it. Uh, and eventually, I my master thesis were about encryption keys and their properties in memory. So, from a password and pin perspective, of course, uh, it is really interesting to see uh, how much data uh, is in memory while a machine is on, and also on certain uh, OSs like, uh, for example, um, uh, OS X, uh, Mac OS X. Um, the password for the, if you use FileVault, the built-in uh, encryption mechanism in uh, Mac OS X, uh, the password is actually not wiped from memory while the machine is on. So that is, if, if you find an open uh, MacBook with a, an encrypted drive, you can still locate the passwords using just uh, a simple string search through memory if you can get access to memory. And I'll show you two ways to get access to memory. And the first way, I know that uh, was discussed a bit uh, last year as well, uh, where they showed how to fetch encryp encryption keys uh, using Firewire. I'm going to expand on that a bit because you really don't need to fetch the encryption key at all if you find a computer that is on. Um, you only need to unlock it. And that is because the FireWire specifications uh, permit certain devices, those that use the serial bus protocol, um, to have direct memory access. And I know this was discussed last year as well, but I'm going to repeat it. Um, when you have direct memory access, you bypass all of the software logic and you can actually read and eventually write directly to the memory if you connect uh, two computers with, with a firewire game. And that is interesting, but there's only uh, some devices or those devices that use the serial bus protocol that has uh, this DMA access. So in order to, to exploit this, we need to pretend to be another type of device. If I would just hook up this machine and this machine with a firewire cable, they would be able to communicate and not, not through direct memory, direct, uh, memory access. So uh, the scenario here is this uh, little laptop here. It's uh, just a uh, Windows XP box. It could be anything. I've done the same trick with, uh, with the Windows 7. Works exactly the same. Uh, the only thing is that Windows 7 uh, has to have a lot more memory, so it will take longer to search for it and stuff like that. So that's why I'm using uh, XP. It will also work with uh, Ubuntu, you name it, every OS, really, that permits the uh, Firewire and uh, the uh, serial bus protocol. So um, this one is uh, full disk encrypted with uh, TrueCrypt. So it has a pre-boot pre -boot, uh, authentication scheme where you have to uh, actually enter a password before uh, you can use it at all. Not like uh, the Windows Bit Locker, where you can just power it on and it will power up until the login prompt. And that is, of course, if you understand how full disk encryption works, a big, big security hole because uh, it has to load the encryption key into memory before actually, actually unlocking the disk and starting to process the operating system. So uh, if you use standard mode uh, BitLocker, uh, your computer is vulnerable to this attack uh, even when it's off power off. This one is on. Um, it doesn't have a firewire port. But fortunately, uh, it does have an expansion port, so I can hot plug a firewire port into it while, uh, uh, while it's on. And Windows will uh, gracefully install the drivers. Uh, and when I say that, hey, I'm an iPod, uh, it will also give me direct memory access. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to show this to you now. And uh, what I'm going to do is basically to search through memory uh, using a tool called uh, Winlock Ohm, which is made by a uh, New Zealander called MetalStorm. Uh, this is kind of an old hack. It's, or it's from 2007, 8. I think it was publi publicly available from 2008. But it still works. And uh, there's still people that generate new signatures um, for unlocking a new type of operating systems. So basically how this works is that I plug into this machine 
and uh, it will give me direct memory access. Uh, and when I get that, I will start to sniff the yellow machine's memory live, and uh, I will search for a signature, which is basically uh, the call in the uh, in XP uh, that checks for a password. Then, when I found that signature, the program will hot patch that call, so it will always return true, no matter what what you put into the password. Uh, so actually write back into the memory of the other machine. So it's kind of like live brain surgery in a computer world. Okay. I think we can move a bit closer. I think I only have so many meters with fiber cable. much on this screen, I can tell you right, right away, because um, hopefully it will have nothing. Okay. So just to show you that this is a, a locked machine, if I enter a blank password I can't get in. Uh, and this is uh, full disk encrypted with AES using a 256-bit key. So it's, this is, should be kind of a strong and protected setup. But the, that assumption uh, disappears if you keep the computer on. Because as long as the software uh, and the full disk encryption is running, uh, the software needs to keep the encryption key in memory. And when you have a full disk encryption system, that means that it will be in the memory of the machine as long as the machine is, uh, is powered on. Alright, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a bit technical, uh, I'm going to, yeah, you can see this, I'm going to load some custom made drivers uh, into the OS here, because I need to be able to write to the FireWire uh, device, which is not really common. I'm gonna. I'm just loaded the uh, two firewire devices. Uh, oh, sorry. Just to be able to to uh, actually communicate with, the, with this machine, and I uh, also need uh, write access. I should now be able to run uh, one of the tools in the in the suit that uh, this metal storm guy made. I'm actually going to change shell here. Uh, it's called uh, bus info, and and what it does it just uh, queries the firewire bus and sees what the information lies on it. Because as I mentioned, um, you can only uh, You can only uh, communicate over DMA with this one if I'm an iPod. And I'm going to show you now how to become an iPod. <laughs> For those of you who doesn't know how to. Okay, uh, I, I just run the bus info information. There's lots and lots of information. Uh, but basically, the thing that you need to notice is here uh, that I am now identifying myself uh, as a Linux machine, which is not really what I want to do. So what I can do now is um, uh, I can use another another tool called the room tool to uh, load the CSR or the the read-only memory from an iPod that was sniffed from an iPod onto my FireWire interface here. So. If I run the bus info again, you can see now that I'm now identifying myself as an iPod, a FireWire iPod. And the thing here is that 
iPod is one of the devices that uses the serial bus protocol. And that means that when I connect to this machine, uh, it will say, ah, Firewire iPod, okay, you use the serial bus protocol, here you go, direct memory access. So, just to show you, if I now plug myself into this one, okay, it's not much happening there, but you might have heard two sounds, that is uh, Windows XP installing my drivers for me on the fly. Uh, and I can now run the winlock on tool. Um, this tool has, like I said, signatures for lots and lots of operating systems. Uh, Windows 7 implements a lot of text here, but it basically the only thing that you need to tell the tool is to each, uh, which port and uh, node and what type of attack you want. So this is firewire port 0, node 1, attack 2, which is basically unlock Windows XP. And I probably need it to do as well. So what this does now is it. Well, that was quick. <laughs> um, it's snarf. It's, it's snarfing memories of the other machine, uh, and it looks at, it looks for a certain signature, and it finds it, and it writes back to the memory of this machine, and then it hot touches the call that checks for the password. So as you can see over here right now, uh, if I want to log on to this machine now. I would just hit enter, that password, and it would tell me that I haven't really get the right passwords, but if I hit enter one more time, it's a bit of a trick there that it uh, tries to fool me, but I'm, I'm still in. So that's a very easy way to get full access to a system that has a firewire port or an expansion port, and which has not been properly uh, hardened. Because you can remove all firewire drivers, you can <laughs> you can glue the <laughs> the expansion ports. You can do a lot of tricks to, to prevent this. But we we did that in December actually to glue to glue our firewire ports. <laughs> How did that go down with the users? <laughs> so, okay. No, I I did it at home. Just it is at home. home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going on through an EDB and gluing every port. <laughs> quite a job. That was, that was after the password. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, of course, uh, with the new MacBook Pros right now, there's a new uh, interface, um, Thunderbolt. And the rumors has it that this also has kind of the same feature, you know, permitting, um, permitting DMA through the hardware. And it's really not a, a software problem at all, because uh, the hardware is. Uh, or the specification specific, specifically says that you should load the uh, serial bus protocol drivers and permit DMA because this will give you uh, quicker throughput when transferring large files because you don't have to go through the processor. So it's really not a Windows problem, uh, it's more of a hardware specification problem. And that is one of the things that I feel is important is that it, it is hard to build something secure when you're building an open hardware that is meant to just work like plug and play. Okay, I'm going to show you another track as well. Uh, it, it will be a bit less like the one you saw last year, but I know it was mentioned. Because <coughs> while I was writing my master thesis, a couple of bright guys up at Princeton, uh, they uh, found a way to. to yeah, sorry. On on this one, uh, obviously, the machine, in order for it to load the fire drivers, must have had them in its own before. Right? Yeah. So, is it the case that if you have a machine that didn't have them, then at this point you wouldn't be able to load them, or is this not a protection because? But well, what happens? Uh, you would not be able to load them. Depending on if you are, if this machine was online and configured to download drivers automatically, for example, that would probably defeat that one as well. But as long as if you have like physically removed the DLLs that are loaded as a part of this driver loading mechanism, uh, I would not get direct memory access. So that is the easiest way to protect yourself from this type of attack. That applies to Linux and everything to do to remove the modules or build your own kernel, etc., etc. Yeah. So if I am the attacker and I find this laptop and this doesn't work presumably because it hasn't loaded the drivers, is it enough for me just to plug in an Ethernet cable so it would automatically upload or would this, would this work? Uh, I've heard about attacks 
through Ethernet as well, but I think that would not be... Not Ethernet, just for uh, uh, letting it upload the drivers. Uh, XP by default won't download the... It'll come through the wizard that you can go hit it to automatically go download, but it doesn't just do it by itself. And then it might not do it as well if the machine is locked, like in this example. So, uh, so is this effective protection and just removing this firmware? Yeah, I would say that. That is, that is the best software way to, to play to your machine. Yeah, I think the best is probably disable the BIOS. And yeah, block the BIOS. there's a combination of things you can do. Uh, I will get back to it in the end. Uh, because uh, you, you can disable, uh, you, you can pass for protective BIOS, you can uh, disable uh, uh, or lock down. Uh, yeah, lock down the bias and password protecting the bias is always a good idea, but it would <coughs> apply to this because to get to it you'd have to switch it off and then Yeah, it, it will apply to the next next attack, that's why I mentioned <laughs> it. Because um, if you if you haven't uh, password protected the bias, uh, you will be able to boot into another OS, which I'm gonna show you how you can exploit um, and get the encryption key of this machine right now. But, uh, there's there's a combination of things you can do. Uh, Specifically for the firewire thing, you can uh, you should uh, uh, you should definitely remove those drivers. But of course, then again, you won't be able to communicate over the serial bus protocol with devices that really actually benefit from it. So if there, there there is, I don't think there's such a solution that is without loss of functionality, unfortunately, security wise. But can yeah. it be the conclusion that physical security is the most important? If you want real security, you cannot do anything without physical security. So if you want to secure a device, you need to control access. Yeah, uh, basically that is uh, one of the other things that you can do. You can make sure that the device doesn't get out of your hands while it's on. That's right. It's in the, the protected room. Yeah. But uh, of course this is harder and harder because of you have these, right? And you don't want to go and turn these off uh, every time you... Uh, don't know exactly where it is. So, uh, and even though you maybe might be putting it just in flight mode or whatever, and there's a certain kind of drive throw towards always being connected and always being on. So I think that the users will probably oppose. Uh, they all already do because they don't turn off their PCs when they, they said put it in standby. And if this machine was in standby when I found it, I just put powered it on and it will boot up. And it will present me with the same. Uh, same login window. If it was in Hibernate, that would be harder because I'm using TrueCrypt and they have have a pre-boot authentication screen. But still, yeah, uh, absolutely, physical security is is important when it comes to devices like this. Absolutely. Wasn't it password that showed us the attack on Hibernate? What was that? Yeah, password. Yeah. So uh, pass. Password attacks or attacks on, on the Hibernate file works as long as the drive is not full disk encrypted. Or all the drives are not full disk. The system drive is not full disk encrypted. Because if the disk is full disk encrypted, uh, the hibernation file will be put on an encrypted volume and if the machine is off, then you won't have access to it. But still, uh, if, if, if you just encrypt like one partition, uh, then that is definitely a, a viable attack for me. So, but these these Crimson guys, they found a way to, to do the cold boot attack, and I know that this was mentioned last year as well, but I thought I'm going to demonstrate how they actually do it, because it's not that hard. But people think that, oh my god, you have to use like a freezing uh, fluid, nitrogen and whatever to do this, but it's, it's not really hard, and it works. So I think I'm going to show you how to do a cold boot attack. And the, basically, uh, the thing why it works is is because uh, that modern uh, physical memory modules, RAM modules, uh, use a certain period to lose its state. So if it's powered on and you cut the power, it uses a couple of seconds to, to like zero out. So and this can this period can be extended if you cool it down. So if you cool it down sufficiently, you can extend the period while it keeps its state or maintains its state. Uh, for quite a long time, uh, they, they did some some tests with liquid nitrogen, and they were able to cool down memory chips, uh, put them in uh, freezing uh, or in um, in a nitrogen, and um, transport them a couple of hours from one place to a lab, and then put it on in another machine, dump the memory, and analyze it, and the memory was still 
as it were when they powered off the machine. So it's possible uh, if you freeze it sufficiently to keep the state. And that is because I'm not a physicist, but I'm guessing it's because of the physical properties of, uh, of condensators and stuff like that that is in uh, modern modules. Because in dynamic RAM you have to do like a, um, a refresh power cycle of the RAM each x milliseconds in order to keep its state. So uh, in order to keep the power consumption low, uh, and, and also in order to keep cooler RAM chips, I would guess that it would be a desirable property that the RAM chips uh, would need only a few power cycles each second to keep, to keep it stable. So, I wrote a program that does the analyzing bit, because if you, when you get the memory dump from the other machine, you need to analyze it. So what I did, I, I basically um, created a program that can search for AES two fish and serpent keys, uh, and I've, I've tested it in a lot of systems. And usually, all like full disk encryption systems uh, are vulnerable to to the to the attack. The Princeton guys actually fully automate this so that you can just uh, hit enter almost on this machine and just reboot that, and it will uh, dump the memory and analyze it and unlock the disk on the fly. I'm going to show you how to find the, uh, the encryption key. Because as long as the full disk encryption system runs, it needs the key in memory. So if you are able to get a fresh copy of the memory, the encryption key is there. So again, not a Windows problem, but still uh, there's a lot of uh, software that is vulnerable to this type of attack. OK, so I think I'm going to show you. Uh, what I need is basically I'm going to dump the memory over a crossover cable. Uh, from this machine and to this machine. So what I need is um, uh, dust off, or the thing that you use to uh, remove dust from components and stuff like that. If you invert this, you get only the, uh, I don't know what this is called in English, but the, the gas that it uses to propel the air out of the box, uh, which is basically ice cold when it, when it hits. It works. Uh, very good to you can freeze grapes with it and stuff like that as well. It's really cold. So I can use that to uh, to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, this is in the U.S. I guess it would be like a huge sticker on this. If it's yeah, yeah, but I think it's a warning somewhere that you shouldn't you yeah. should hold it upright while blowing. Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna disregard that. And I need some uh, like uh, plastic foil in order to. Uh, this is kind of like a housewife hack. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> just to try to keep. Uh, I, don't, I don't want too much uh, moisture or condensation on, on the on the chips. And what else do I need? I think that's that actually. Uh, so the first thing to do is just to connect to uh, connect the two machines. And I apologize for those of you who had might have seen this before, because uh, I've seen it been done before as well. Uh, let's just assume uh, that the password of that machine is still intact in memory, and, and that, um, uh, that I didn't, haven't hacked it already. Oh, let's see. Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, that computer, uh, you changed the memory. If you reboot it, it will be sort of protected again, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yes, it will. Um, so I'm probably going to need help from one of you guys to hold the, the plastic foil in when, I'm, when I'm freezing it. And first, I'm just going to make sure that uh, I have everything in place here. <coughs> So I just made a short script. What it does, it, um, it sets up a DHCP server and a TFTP server on this machine. What I'm going to do is basically freeze the memory, uh, take the power hard, um, and then I'm going to power it on again as fast as I can. And then I'm going to try to boot over the network instead of booting from the original OS. 
what's going to happen is that since I'm power cycling it really quick, the memory content still is going to be intact when I'm when I'm booting into the other OS. And the other OS is loaded through the, this crossover cable. And the only function of this other OS is to dump the memory back over the cable. So uh, I'm, go I'm going to show you uh, afterwards uh, how this uh, really works. But first I need to get the temperature on, on this uh, RAM chips uh, sufficiently low. So I'm, I don't know, Fed, do you want to yeah. help out? I've been cheating a bit because I've, I've already unscrewed uh, the memory chips under here. <laughs> Basically, uh, what I need to do is just to hold it, try to hold it still. And I'll, I don't know if you, all of you guys can see right now. But, uh, oh, yes. Maybe if you can stand a little bit behind me. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you guys, I'm kind of happy that you just laughed on that. <laughs> Okay, I, yeah, I don't know how, I'm going to try not to spray on you because that will be pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. I guess you can get full speed of this. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me before it hurts me. Okay. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to power cycle it. Did you forget to start your script? That's okay. Okay, good. Um, I might be able to show you this. You got a permission denied. No, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay. It doesn't really matter. Thanks. So. see right now is uh, basically um, our rig machine just asking for an IP and downloading uh, a memory scraper uh, over the, the, the cable. And as you can see it's just right now waiting for a handshake uh, in order to dump uh, the memory content over from this machine to this machine. So I'm going to give it uh, that handshake. And oops, all I need, all I need is the IP of that machine, and that is one more ten. I'm just gonna, oops. I'm just gonna pipe the output to uh, memory. Binary file. So, as you can see over there right now, it's dumping the memory contents over this cable right here. And if I'm lucky, uh, the, the content will still be intact. <laughs> uh, and I will, I'll be able to search for its encryption key. And uh, when it's finished dumping, it's just going to power itself off. So, these tools are basically open source tools, the one I've showed you so far. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay, so we don't need, need this anymore. Uh, but in order to search for the encryption key here, I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use my own tool uh, just because I'm here. Um, it's called Interrogate, and this is basically the tool that I used uh, that I wrote during my master thesis. It's not really main maintained, but it still does. Uh, uh, the job in terms of searching for encryption keys. 
And just to be quicker right now, I'm going to tell the, the tool what kind of uh, encryption keys it's looking for and what size it's looking for. Uh, it doesn't have to get this as a input, but uh, it will quicken the search a bit. Uh, and I'm, since this machine is fairly stable, I also know approximately where in the memory uh, the encryption keys are located, and that is also quite kind of stable, the address. So I'm going to give it um, a range to look in, and uh, I'm just going to give the file that I just downloaded over the Ethernet cable uh, as input. And what it basically does now in order to find the keys is that it uses the AES uh, key expansion algorithm to locate the keys because AES and many other encryption algorithms work the way that they expand the master key into a schedule of uh, many keys that it uses in each round of the algorithm. So in the, the AES case, uh, it does this and it, so all the round keys in the key schedule are derived from the master key. Well, okay, so the one of you that has done some C programming can think that if you, you use a struct or something, a structure to hold the keys and you generate something from, from, the, from this master key and you put it right after it in memory, you could think of an algorithm to find this key uh, that is such that go through each byte offset in memory Pretend that the following 256 bytes are uh, parts of an encryption key, generate the key schedule, and compare the key schedule to the keys or to the bytes that are uh, lo located right after the, the assumed master key. And that, if it's a match, uh, this is more, little, it's 100% uh, sure that this is uh, an encryption key. Um, the 100% thing is, of course, debatable, but it's still. Uh, an encryption key is one of its property, properties is that it's supposed to look random. This also uh, looks kind of random. Uh, so this is in fact a 256 uh, master key of the, this machine. And this is the key schedule that was loaded in the memory while the machine was on. So what I will do now in order to um, in order to unlock this machine would be to use uh, this key. Uh, I probably have to do some modifications to TrueCrypt in order to de decrypt the disk, and I can just use the raw key as input and decrypt the disk. Um, and it actually, I think someone has made a tool for that as well. And it, there are tools for uh, decrypting PGP encrypted disks and uh, BitLocker as well, I think. So I'm not completely in like in control of this PC, but I still have the encryption key. And if you remember from the start of my presentation, the encryption key is where this, where the security of the encryption lies. So uh, having the encryption key basically means that the encryption of this machine is, is broken. Can you forbid uh, having the expansion key in the memory, just uh, uh, compute it on the fly when you encrypt or decrypt? Yes. Uh, and that is usually what the, the tools does, but since this is whole disk encryption, it encrypts and decrypts all the time, so it doesn't have any time to wipe the key from memory. Because these keys are used in each round, each encryption of each uh, data, data segment. Uh, these keys are used, so these are used all the time, so that's why it's always in memory. Yeah, too fast is, uh, to, to, uh, to make things faster, but yeah. if you want to uh, uh, to make your tool not working, then you just don't do this. Yeah, but there's other you find the key in this case. Yeah, but there's other, other ways of finding this key. I haven't mentioned it. You can, you can also search for if you know the the structure of uh, of the data structure that is holding the key. You can also search for that using kind of entropy measures and stuff like that. That is that is how how yeah, I find. This, uh, guys from Russia talked last time, so they do some entropy searches as well. Yeah, so you can there's there's other ways of finding these keys as well. So. Uh, basically, uh, the problem here isn't that the key is in the memory because uh, that is property of software encryption. Yeah, turn, if you turn the laptop off, make sure that it, uh, the, the RAM hasn't maintained any state. Um, other than that, uh, don't leave it laying around running. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where in memory does the dump program locate itself? Uh, it, 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 it's used that for key storage. 
Yes. Uh, you can if if you. The problem is that it loads this. Uh, it uh, is um, the the program that I loaded over the cable is really really small. It's uh, called in ASM and it's uh, it's made specifically to be as leave as little fingerprint as possible uh, in the memory of the the victim computer. That being said, yes, if you can specifically tell the OS to load the keys into a specific area uh, that you know it will be overwritten when I try to load the program, that would probably be helpful, but still I don't, I'm not sure that you can do that because the OS only sees virtual memory. Uh, so uh, you can't really tell where in the memory, and the memory that I get over here is not virtual memory, it's the raw physical uh, bits of the, of the chips. So I don't think uh, I don't think you have that a possibility in uh, modern days OSs. Team Team Any more questions regarding this? Okay, but anyway, you need uh, to have boot enabled, uh, yes. boot or other way of boot, yeah. and uh, your BIOS inside your notebook uh, should not wipe memory. So some clever biases wipe memory before starting anything. Yes, if you have the um, I think uh, most of you guys will remember that uh, old PCs used to have like a memory self-check uh, that basically wipes out all the memory. Uh, so if you want to, you can turn that on again. Uh, modern day OS does doesn't really need that check anymore, but uh, that could be a security measure. And password protect your BIOS and don't allow booting from other OSs. That would also Help. But it doesn't look like a big protection because you can freeze your stuff, <coughs> take the chips, and put them in another laptop. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So, but of course, uh, these are things that you can do if, um, for, from an attacker's perspective, uh, you cannot really know whether the BIOS is locked or what obstacles you will find when you you boot it off. So, if I would be 100% sure to get the memory contents. I would actually take them out of the machine and put them in the machine. Okay. Uh, just one comment. Uh, a password lock bias isn't really a protection either because it can still be reset. Yeah. Well, it's right. You most probably would have to dismantle that to the computer, but like, still. Resets of. Uh, you, you can zero Resetting the BIOS. Uh, Resetting the password. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Point. There's, some, there's some jumper in there. Actually, in, in notebooks there is no jumper. Uh, half a year ago, I'm unlocked, uh, accidentally locked by hardware, uh, old Toshiba notebook, and uh, I built, uh, I found an internet solution. I built uh, some schema that plugged into uh, uh, printer port to reset BIOS. I disassembled the whole notebook. I find no jumper that allows me to reset the password. But uh, the manufacturer well. left some back door. For modern notebooks, uh, you should never, you probably will never find that back door. I believe it exists, but it's known only for manufacturer. There is no bias like on uh, ordinary motherboard from big computer. No jumper. Well, uh, actually, no. Companies like Dell have a master password that actually uh, only the service techs are supposed to have that will. I have to know people that work. I was wondering, have you, have you tested just moving the chips? Because uh, especially laptops, they are pretty slow in upgrading the RAM types, so it would be quite easy, cheap to have a spare cracked book available. But have you, is, is, is it enough to do that? On this machine, yes, it works. Yeah. It depends a bit on the RAM type. Uh, some, some types uh, have uh, quite fast updating uh, frequency, so it will, uh, you need to really cool it down to like minus 50 degrees and before you take it out, or before you take power. But it depends, this one here is quite stable, I don't think. You need to cool it a bit and then it will hold for 10, 20, maybe 30 seconds. So the lesson is always run uh, point computing apps to keep the system as hot as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Running boy. Yeah, then when yeah. you keep it, you, the, you store the keys on the external. Yes. Source. Well, you can use you can hardware. Hardware encryption will efficiently defeat this if the keys are, or if it's encrypted at the hardware level. Uh, you can store 
using software encryption, there is really nowhere else at the moment you can store the keys than in memory. There has been talks about the uh, Intel and other processor uh, manufacturers implementing like a small register to keep encryption keys specifically. That yeah. would probably make it a lot harder to. Yeah, to they, they were actually just published a paper on that one. Yeah. Yeah, for hiding possibly the decryption key actually within the CPU registers instead of in yep. memory. I, I just wanted to say, say uh, there's a software called Trezor. Uh, they are using the debug uh, registers of the processor to store the key. Actually, oh, cool. That would, as long as you store it somewhere else than uh, the memory. It's, uh, again, though, <laughs> if you talk about the hibernation file thing. Uh, the hibernation file actually contains the processor straight state as well, so you will have a problem there. But uh, for this one, this attack that I uh, I showed you right now, it won't work. I think. Okay, I think we have to move on. Uh, we you have know, been. You are sending it your your own boot program. Yeah. Right. So if this thing developed and when you had the specs and so on, your boot program could dump the processor copy. Um, not really sure how that would work, but uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, you, I guess you'd have to freeze the process. Well. <laughs> 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 the no, 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 we are talking about the one where the hammer is found. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that worked. But, uh, again, it's um, as long as you keep or use software for encryption, I think uh, you will have a problem uh, about uh, where to store the encryption keys. And be wary of uh, hardware encryption on hard drives and this the nice thing together in which it turns out a lot of manufacturers that say that ADS 256 bit um, are not. That, that is the problem with the hard drive encryption. It's really hard to actually get uh, because an encryption algorithm is only as strong as uh, the number of peer reviews it has had, and it's harder to audit and uncheck a uh, hard drive encryption mechanism than, uh, than for example, two encrypt, which is open source. So. Vendors, vendors say that hard drives are very secure. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mentioned we, we've talked a lot of, uh, of about protection. I want to know, I want to tell you the, the basic. Uh, you don't really need very much to attack uh, a physical, uh, at least on a laptop, you don't need very much spe special equipment. Uh, firewire cables and, um, yeah, I forgot to give you these. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, a, ter a thermometer, I use this uh, oh when, I've, uh, when, uh, when we need to cool it down. Uh, I've been down to 50 minus 50 degrees, and I think I may have time for that story because I, we were at a, a Norwegian client in a, in a small city in Norway, or internationally, I think it would be called a village, and uh, we were testing a, a very special machine, which was basically a PC, but it was uh, in a kind of a special box, and it was designed to be secure and actually stay out in a potentially hostile environment for uh, for. Uh, without maintenance for a very very long time, and it was hard. Uh, it was um, a hard disk encryption uh, there. I think they used uh, TrueCrypt, and we were trying to see if it was possible to get the encryption keys because that was actually a real attack scenario. But the problem with this was that uh, the uh, memory modules were so deep inside the computer, and we couldn't take the computer out of the box without taking the power. So we had a really big uh, trouble actually freezing uh, the memory modules enough. So we, we thought, uh, I was there with a, a colleague of mine, um, uh, which is uh, he's a bit older than me and a bit, uh, a bit uh, lower. And uh, yeah, he, he really looks like a hacker. And, he, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were thinking, how can we get the, the, the freezing liquid into the machine without hurting it and at the same time getting low enough temperatures? So, we needed something that was long and it was it was waterproof, and uh, it should be uh, yeah it should transfer heat or, or or cold very good. And we were thinking, and of course there is one thing that is efficient, and that is condoms. So uh, condoms is actually quite good to if you are having trouble getting the the liquid to the the right spot, and uh, we. 
we uh, we all right. We w went to the local shop and uh, I went for uh, buying condoms. Um, me and this other guy, <laughs> hacker guy. <laughs> <laughs> we were looking at the, the different types and we were like, no, not strawberry. I don't think that would be professional. <laughs> <laughs> would be professional. Uh, and uh, then I, I looked at my my friend and he was having this big smile on his face and I thought I said to him. Um, Okay, you have to go outside, I can't <laughs> So, he uh, went outside, and he went like this, and he's just positioned himself right outside the shop, we're like... <laughs> okay, keep, it, keep it outside the candy store. And I went uh, to the cashier and uh, bought this packet, and, uh, and uh, the girl behind the desk, she looked really weird at me. And then he looked up at this guy, and then I asked her for a receipt, because I was going to... <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So uh, it's a bit of a funny story, but it. it I'm a forensics works. expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, we practice uh, safe hacking, uh, and, uh, and uh, but it actually worked. Uh, it works actually actually quite good. They don't really need big funds to to be able to pull off these kind of tricks. Um, so we talked a lot about protection already. Uh, disable Hibernate and stuff like that uh, is a good trick. Um, we already talked about locking and password protecting your BIOS. And also physically shut down your firewire ports is an option. Not if you're in a big uh, company, but maybe privately. <laughs> uh, but inform your employees, and this is uh, kind of like a big thing for me because uh, the information security policy is there for a reason. And there's actually a reason why you are supposed to turn off your machine. It's, uh, because uh, all the policies that I've seen uh, just say, turn off your machine. And uh, the employee says, why? And as the IT security guys, we don't know. <laughs> so this is actually a good reason to turn off your machine. Uh, uh, and uh, use hardware and tamper-proof encryption devices is a good thing. And uh, endpoint protection devices or endpoint protection software. There is a lot of software that can detect these type of attacks. Maybe not the last one, but uh, at least the, the firewire attack. Uh, so that could also be good to have new protection. But the best thing is, of course, a combination of these, not one single uh, mitigating uh, factor. So, uh, summarized, um, hardware or all the side channels can be used to do fairly exotic attacks and be fairly efficient against fairly well-secured computers. And it is hard to build security on an open and plug-and-play platform. Uh, and please don't be paranoid. Uh, and uh, I hope that you've learned something today. And um, that's all I have. So if there's any questions at the end. Yes? Yeah, I have one. Uh, you mentioned that we have worked with uh, police. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you use these tricks for the criminal computers to get the data out, when you, is it, does it go through? The, I know there's been uh, actually last year the first conviction that uh, uh, in the US uh, that used memory uh, as part of uh, the evidence chain um, was actually uh, successful. I don't know. I don't remember if they found encryption keys and were decrypted or they, or if they found like the child pornography or whatever in the memory. But uh, yes, I know it's been used at least in, in court in the US. I'm not sure if it's been used in Norway. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that this attack is this attack is kind of like something you do. It's more for forensics guys than it is for the regular hacky guy. So of course, it's it's possible. So if you are uh, really targeted towards one individual or one company, this could be an avenue. But no, I don't think. I don't think I don't see this as a high risk scenario, but it's still a scenario. So and if you <laughs> I wouldn't recommend using sixty four bit keys anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, another thing was uh, uh, for instance on Linux would it be enough to just blacklist temporarily the firewire because that's No. No. Be 
Well, you can read the documentation on it. The blacklist, uh, you have to disable the auto-loader, and the blacklist doesn't apply to modules that boot time scripts may load, so you actually have to pack up the scripts quite a bit, at least on Debian and Ubuntu. And, and there is no work on patching those drivers, for instance, to have a something out of touch and kernel memory to enable DMA explicitly. Something, that something would, in between. That would violate the spec. spec. Who cares? <laughs> 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 so we're already violating the spec technically because you have a firmware port but it's not enabled. So. I suppose you've just you heard of the kernel. I haven't heard of any, any discussion about that. Uh, of course, it would be possible. If you because want the to easiest thing was just to move the kernel module somewhere that the scripts won't find them so you can manually load them. To, uh, well, yeah, you need to, uh, to do, of course. Okay, well, we're past time, so I would just uh, like to say thank you, Carsten, and uh, I just hope my fingers will. <laughs> 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 <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you.